Hi, welcome to Brown Baglet. We're really happy to have you here. I'm Chloe Miller, co-founder along with Shasta Grant, who is here. We opened the doors to Brown Bag Lit this January with classes, events, and more. And today we're really happy to welcome Minna Dubin and Stella Fiore. We look forward to welcoming you to future Brown Bag Lit happening with you through, all right, so let's be sure to mute, thanks. Um, through November, we're offering the first, the new first draft club with writing time on Tuesdays, one-on-one -on -one sessions with your mentor, prompts and written feedback. And this is for poetry and prose. We also offer monthly classes in both prose and poetry. The next class is a prose class on ordering your stories with Shasta Grant. Like today's event, we have lots of free and online events offered from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the next one is with Yoshanda Sanders on Friday, October 6th to discuss her new book, Women of the Post, which I think you'll really love. You'll see our full schedule online and I'll be posting lots of links in the chat. So for today, if you can please stay muted during the reading and question period with Stella and Minna, I recommend you put the screen on speaker view during the reading and then gallery view for the Q&A. Please do keep the chat open so you can ask questions, follow up the links and share anything that you like about the work and the conversation. Do be reminded that Brown Bag Lit readings are free. We really encourage you to buy the author's books like Mom Rage by Minna today, which we'll be talking about. It is available through Scrawl Books, a really lovely independent bookstore in Virginia. And I'll put the link in the chat. So on to our show. We're really excited to present Stella Fiore to introduce Minna Dubin. Stella is the inaugural Rutan Beckett writer in residence at the Conference House Park on Staten Island, where she's at work on her debut novel. In 2018, she created a community for writer mothers and continues to participate in Lenka Clayton's artist residency in motherhood, Aram and you can learn more about her. And she will introduce Stella, turning it over to you now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chloe and Shasta for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and so now we will get into it, ladies. Mom Rage, I'm so excited. Um, let me introduce Minna to start. Minna Dubin is a writer and mother in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, Forward, Salon, Parents, Romper, Hobart, Mother Magazine, and Literary Mama. She is the recipient of an Artist Enrichment Grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. As a leading feminist voice on Mom Rage, Minna has appeared on MSNBC, Good Morning America, The Tamron Hall Show, NBC10 Boston, and NPR. And here is her debut. Mom Rage out now from Steel Press. So excited. Um, Minna. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so um, first, I just want to say thank you for creating this space where moms can gather and talk publicly about their anger without the guilt and the shame, but with humility and curiosity thanks to like the vulnerability and honesty of your hard work. And I'm just so appreciative and so excited to be here to celebrate you and this book. Finally, um, I thought we'd enter the conversation just by giving everyone some background on how Minna and I met, um, because the fact that this book exists in the world is, is a triumph. Like how does a mom of two young children write a book? in the first place? And then how does she do that during a pandemic? Um, and part of the answer to that is how Minna and I met. So um, about five years ago now, um, I was doing this radio show here on Staten Island for Maker Park Radio. Uh, my show is called Cut and Paste. I was a mom of a three-year-old who felt like I would never be able to return to my writing life. So I started the show because at least I could talk about writing with, with other writers. And I um, was very excited to have the fabulous author, Amy Shern, on my show, who's here in the Zoom chat, um, to talk to her about like how she made it happen. Um, and in researching that show, I came across um, 
something called an artist residency in motherhood, which was started actually by a visual artist um, out in Portland, Oregon at the time. And what it is, uh, the way she describes it is um, a self-directed open source artist residency that reframes parenthood as a valuable site for creative practice rather than an obstruction to be overcome, which turning the whole thing on its head. So I, I said, Amy, like, I'm doing this. Do you want to do it with me? And she said, yes. And we chose Super Bowl Sunday weekend. And we invited our mom friends. And someone invited Minna. I don't even know who it was. Um, and that was five years ago. And here we are today. We, we had such a great weekend that we decided to do it twice a year. Um, we've been doing it twice a year, every year since during the pandemic. Obviously, we didn't do do an Aram weekend, um, but but we did like a year in start um, having these like monthly just check ins to check in on each other as moms um, and specifically moms who also write, which is like another burden slash joy. Um, and, you know, in that time, Minna went from you know, writing these mom lists, which I'm going to get to later on in the show, to in 2019, I think, was um, an article that she wrote for the New York Times on mom rage that went viral. It was, I think, republished again, right, in 2020 during the pan pandemic. And now we have this, this debut book. So it's just been amazing for me to see this arc for her and, um, just to be here to celebrate it with her. And Chloe is also in the group. So this is a true like Aram event. Thank you again, Chloe, for starting this other community and having us having us here. So, um, you know, Min and I were, were saying how we, we found each other because of our desperation, like our desperation in those days to kind of get through the, the daily struggle of like the days and nights and what are even days and nights when you have infants and toddlers, right? Um, and also in the midst of that very relentless labor, the struggle to reclaim ourselves, our I identities, particularly for Minna and I as artists and writers. And um, Minna covers so much in this book. You know, I was... The first half to me is, is like kind of laying the groundwork for why moms are so mad in the first place and like what the cultural landscape looks like. And then the second half of the book, she offers a lot of um, like digging deeper into what is mom rage? How can we work with it? How can we befriend it? How can we use it as a transformational tool? Lots of resources. Um, so I thought we'd start... Um, with how difficult <laughs> consuming and essential women's care work really is, which really came to light during the pandemic and why holding on to all the facets of our identities and doing so in community is so important. And I thought Minna could read um, from the end of chapter four, Matrescence and the Gaslighting of Mothers. All the titles for her chapters are pretty amazing. Um, so yes, Minna, please read to us. All right. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Okay. <clears throat> in the years that have passed, I've gotten lost in motherhood a few more times, but the self that I rebuilt during those crucial years has sustained me through new phases of matrescence so that I don't feel quite as disoriented or quite as desperate. Identity building is essential, but challenging work for mothers. Everything in society is against us exploring and nourishing our non-mother parts. Intensive mothering leaves us very little time to do anything for ourselves. The cultural narrative says mothers should be satisfied with, with lives solely devoted to caregiving. And if we're not, Society gaslights us by telling us our dissatisfaction with our singular lives is a personal failure. The PR team's indoctrination has sunk deep inside me. 
Though Paul says nothing when I leave for a week-long writing residency or hire a babysitter when Paul's out of town so I can go to the San Francisco Dyke March during Pride, I still feel guilty when I prioritize myself. But I try my best to push past that guilt because the alternative is the great motherhood reduction. My busy, complex, creative, sexual, intellectual self diminishing into a self-hating, snack-making nap warden. I refuse to march willingly into the lost mother valley, silent, but for the echoes of others' praise. So far, we've covered the way the PR team's cultural narrative entraps mothers and how that narrative is enforced by cultural gaslighting, which coerces mothers to publicly perform wellness as their former complex selves wither away. Because moms seem to have it under control and because our labor continues to benefit society, lawmakers and taxpayers have no real incentive, financial or otherwise, to invest in mother care by improving the barely existent systemic infrastructure. And to top it all off, the bone deep exhaustion from the ever expanding caregiving requirements of intensive mothering obliterates mother's energy to speak out or organize to change any of it. So powerful, <laughs> so powerful. There's so much there. How, so my first question for you, Minna, is how did you manage to transcend the bone deep exhaustion and the guilt and the lack of infrastructure to support you in order to write this book? And it seems to me that like rage itself is, is a key. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit and talk about your process with us a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I begun that process when when my son was two and I started doing this mom lists project before this book, it like I would take myself, I would I put him in more care than he had been in before. And then I would take myself to the, you know, to the cafe and sit at the blank screen, basically trying to write out lists about motherhood because I just like, I had to do something. I was going to lose my mind if I didn't start writing or doing something that wasn't caregiving or domestic labor. Um, and I think that this is sort of, this book in a way is sort of the same, right? Because the pandemic happened and I think that mothers, myself included, felt like this acute desperation that felt really similar actually to like those first couple of years. And, and I'll say that like, so the pandemic began, right? March, 2020, August, 2019. So about six months before was the first time that I had both my children in both of them in school. So I was so excited for that year. And then six months later, it was gone. And I just was like, I just, it was just, it felt like, I felt complete despair. And it felt like it could go on forever. And so I think that this book, like, it was created out of a desperate place. And, um, when, you know, I got an agent who, who was really, really helped me do the proposal. Like we did it back and forth. I would send her drafts and we would be on the phone for hours editing and talking about the proposal. And both of us were just like at home with the door closed, our kids, like our families behind the door. And it just felt like I felt against the clock all the time, you know, because, you know, in an hour, my husband had a patient and he had to like come in our room, which was, we don't have, we have a tiny little house. I'm in my parents' house. This is not my house. Um, and you know, we'd be in this little room that was our bedroom and that was where we worked. So when, like when he was done, we would just like high five and I'd go into the bedroom and shut the door and like get to work. So like, I think that there was like a very strong feeling of desperation, which pushed me to write this book. And also once I got the book contract, I had one year. They were like, great, we want this out in one, that we want this to be done in a year. So I also had this, I didn't make that deadline. It took more like a year and a half, but you know, deadlines are helpful. Mm -hmm. And, and being disciplined. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was clear from our very first Aram that like one of the most difficult things to do and the essential thing to do was that moment of granting ourselves permission to leave 
permission to step away from all of our caretaking and, you know, our kids wanting to be with us and needing us in order to go and do something that doesn't make money that no one really wants us to do or needs us to do, or they don't think that they need us to do it. Um, But like, once we granted ourselves that permission, then it was like, wow, okay, things will fall into place and support me in this because I have said I'm doing this. And then following through with that just felt so huge, you know, because at that time it was hard, you you know, when, when your kids are young to like step away. And you talk about that same need to grant ourselves permission to feel our rage in the book. Um, but be, before we go there, I want to go back to this, the lost mother Valley, like, <laughs> you know, like that's part of the desperation that we're feeling like running from, from, from the Valley, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and like, part of me also wants to say like, <sighs> I, I, I wrote it down. Instead of the great motherhood reduction, which, which, which happens, it could be, or can it be, the great motherhood alchemical rocket ship? <laughs> because <laughs> motherhood can amplify ourselves in all those same ways that it can minimize us. Like it could obviously make us busier, but it can make us, it, it, or it made me anyway, more complex. It can make us more, more sexual, more intellectual, more creative. And like, what does it take to escape the valley for maybe some great mother mountain? Yeah. I mean, for me, it really, you know how like when you can't have something, you want it more or it means Mm -hmm. more to you when you're about to lose it. Yeah. I think it felt like that. Like, I just felt like so much that I needed, like, I was so afraid that I wouldn't be a writer you know, because I had been a writer and then I had my first child and I really didn't write for the next two years. Mm -hmm. And I think I was terrified. So for like, and I think there's, you know, it's different for everyone because not everyone has like a thing that they do that they actually care about. Like some people actually don't have a thing and then they become mothers and they're like, this can be my thing. I have friends like that, you know, Mm -hmm. but I think for, especially for artists, there's like, I think there's a particular desperation and, and it's, and it's a challenge because you don't usually get paid very much for your art. Exactly. And so, and the world tells us like that your value is in the thing that you do that makes money or for women in being a mother. And you talk about that in the book, your money versus mommy, right? Right. Can you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that feels like that, that feels a little bit separate. Like, it, I mean, I want to talk about that too, but um, yeah, I think that like when we talk about Aram, the artist residency and motherhood, like part of the importance of that, of like having this group of mom writers was like, it was, it was people bolstering me to be like, okay, let's do our very important work. Like it's very hard when you're on your own and you're like, I must do my very important work that makes no money and no one might ever see. But when there's a group of people being like, let's do our important work, like chanting it, like that's what it felt like, like a communal chanting. And so it like, it made it easier to do it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, permission. Where am I? Um, Can you read from chapter three, who cares for the caregiver, the last paragraph? Yeah. Rage is a kind of refusal, writes Brittany Cooper, author and professor of women's and gender studies. Most moms have little or no choice but to navigate the existing systems, damaging and paltry as they are. But when we rage, we signal our refusal to be mistreated, undervalued, and uncared for. Without this first fueling step of anger, there will be no change in the family structure or the societal systems. Mothers need that change, and I'm going to explore how we can get it. But first, can we give ourselves a minute to sit in the blistering heat of our anger? Rage need not be productive to be valid. 
In a culture that worships productivity, but doesn't take care of mothers, it is a revolutionary act of self-care for mothers to allow ourselves to just be mad. If we don't give ourselves, if we don't give our fury space to exist, who will? You know, anger, rage, it's not pretty. And it's not easy to sit in. How, you know, one of the questions I had was like, how do you give yourself the permission to do that and sit in it? And maybe you can talk here about like having tea with your rage or something, you know, but, yeah. um, and you, you don't just do it once. You have to keep giving yourself permission. You have to keep choosing self-care. You have to keep choosing writing. How, how do you keep doing that? Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the rage? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's two different pieces to rage, right? Like feeling furious that, that about the situation around you, whether it's like your familial situation and the division of labor in your home or mm -hmm. the larger situation of the cultural neglect of mothers is a very different thing from screaming your head off at your family right? Like you can be mad and not be harming people with your anger. So I see those as two different things. Um, and, you know, part of this book, like, even though I work very hard to say that our rage is not, is not a result of us being bad mothers, I also try and say, but maybe we can look at our rage and like figure out how we cannot, um, how we can learn more about it and like get curious about the wisdom that it holds so that we actually have some power over it. Um, yeah. So I, I'm like, I try and give solutions without, um, without putting blame on mothers, without saying like, it's your fault. You fix it, mom, because that feels very wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I lost the thread of the question. Well, well, I'm, I, I'm asking like how, how you keep that relationship, like a, how you start, to have a healthy relationship with, with your rage, um, how you first acknowledge it, get, get to know it and like work with it. And yeah. then how you keep choosing self-care despite how, you know, everything's working against you making that choice. Right. For, for like, one of the biggest things for me is compassion. Like, I just feel like nobody gives mothers compassion and, and we certainly don't give it to ourselves. And so for me, like the most important thing for me is to look at my rage without hatred, which is looking at me without hatred, um, mm -hmm. you know, and like thinking, I'm always thinking about how to mother myself or mother my rage, like how to, you know, the way that I would, if my kid were to come to me upset, I would be like, it's okay, baby. Like, I feel like that same sort of thing is actually useful with the rage to be like, there she is again. Hi, what do you need? Like, if we approach it with that, like that kind of care and that like syrup voice love, like, I actually think it changes the way that we can react to it. Cause then we get curious. Like if, if our kid would come to us and they were sad and we'd be like, did something happen? What happened? You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I'm serious. Like, I, I really I think that, that 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 reframing changes the way that we feel about our rage. It changes the way we feel about totally. ourselves. Yes. I mean, reading your book made me, I, when I was reading it, I was getting angry. As I told you, like I was getting, especially like reading the first couple of chapters, you know, just like really laying out all the boxes in the basement, as you call them, like the things that make it so feel so impossible, you know? um to be a woman in America to be a mother um but then after I read the the book I felt this huge sense of relief just to like have my um my experience obviously mirrored to me and validated and and to just have language around it and to be able to just take it out of the shadows and and separate it from you know, uh, shame and guilt and, and to just like have a conversation about it and, and talk openly about it, you know, and so it's wonderful. Um, and, and that goes with what I was going to say next, which is going back to these mom lists. So you kind of re-entered 
your writing life as a new mom with this public art project where you would hand write these mom lists. It was hashtag mom lists, right? Or was it just mom lists? It was, was I mean, that? either one, but yes, I always, okay. my camp, I, I was new to social media or new to Instagram <laughs> and hashtag. So I called it hashtag mom lists. <laughs> um, it works. It's great. And so you'd write these very raw, personal, honest lists of observations, frustrations, activities you had done, things on your mind, whatever. And then you just like tape them somewhere, post them somewhere. And I see that project as like an act of self-care, but also an act of care for other mothers reaching out like in this invisible network that we have. We we're so isolated in our homes. And, you know, especially when things are hard, it just feels like some kind of personal failing. Like I'm, I haven't figured this out yet. You know, meanwhile, it's this pattern that's happening all over the world and been happening for generations, right? Of like the struggle of life, you know, trying to figure out how to parent. It's it's hard. It's not easy. And and making this um this gesture of reaching out, you know, is like the the first step toward building a new system of support and care and love and compassion, like, like you say, and, you know, um, recognition. Um, could you read? So the first chapter is the scam of motherhood. And you talk about this PR team that's out there pushing this image of motherhood as, you know, what we might see on Instagram or whatever, you know, at babies are us. Um, can you read the last few paragraphs of that chapter for us? Yeah, it's actually the second chapter. Oh, wait. Um, oh right. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, the PR team is like, it's it's the cultural messaging that we all get about motherhood constantly from everywhere. From girlhood. Right. Starting in girlhood. The PR team is eerily silent about the darker aspects of motherhood. They don't mention that our mental wellness is exponentially more likely to plummet and can remain that way for years, even decades, or that refusing the role of primary parent and household manager is nearly impossible to do without feeling and being perceived as willfully neglectful. Whereas when fathers put their jobs first, the waters part for these good men. Or that relentless workload or that the relentless workload of motherhood that keeps us constantly on the move, even when our bodies are still, edges us ever closer to rage. Or that even though rage is a natural reaction to being systemically stripped of one's power, mothers can't actually claim that any of this is happening to us because we seemingly each made the choice to shrink our own lives. This keeps not only the PR team silent, but us too. Because who exactly can we blame besides ourselves? The PR team? What even is that? How can I get in touch with them? Without public warning or even a whisper network, each mother is left to figure it out herself. What we figure out is that motherhood is not the story we've been fed. We have been duped. The scam of motherhood becomes evident the minute our own needs show up. From maternal health care to child care to elder care, the failures of society's systems to take care of mothers persist for the rest of our lives. But we'd better keep our rage to ourselves because motherhood is the best job a woman can have. So well said, Mina. How, you know, do you think about like talking with younger women who haven't had kids yet? And like, <laughs> how do you strike that balance of, you know, like, where do we go from here? Where do we go from the PR team? I mean, I would hope, my hope is that, you know, each story bolsters the next speaker, mm -hmm. right? I have a quote in the beginning of the book about it. Uh, yeah. And, and so that's how I feel about it. Like I'm telling this story full of other mother's stories. And my hope is that the stories get louder, that people feel permission. I want the book to give people permission 
to talk about what's really happening inside the secret walls of homes. I want the home to stop being this like private place where actually that can actually be quite oppressive for mothers. And my hope is that the story, there are enough stories. There's so many stories. I keep thinking about this quote, like the dam breaks, the waters rush forth, like that, like the PR, that the PR team, the messaging changes because the stories are so loud. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually think about, uh, I don't think about myself personally talking to, to people who might become mothers, but um, I recently had an interview that actually came out in Romper today and the interviewer asked me, is this a book we should be giving new moms at baby showers? <laughs> And I thought, you know, I think so, actually, you know, I don't think they're going to read it, you know, but at, at the beginning, because no one wants to read this at the beginning, but I think that six months in or a year in or two years in or whenever, I think they're going to want to read it. And so I feel like this book is my way of hoping that, that people who are going to have babies have some more awareness. Mm-hmm. You also write about these non-nuclear family structures and alternative communities of 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 care in the book. Um, I want to get in this last excerpt before we we hand it over to the group and see who has questions. Um, this the the chapter who cares for the caregiver, which you know at times can feel like the answer is no one or another caregiver, you know, like or ourselves, each other. Um, can you read from the last chapter of the book, Beyond the Nuclear Family, page 204? Yeah. It is a transgressive act to maintain the vulnerability required to form relationships under systemic oppression. Mother's vulnerability, which is enormous and ever-present, even if we safeguard it with yelling or by appearing to have it all together. And the relationships we form with others are strengths that sustain us. Picking up another mom's kids when they get sick at school and the parents can't get there in time. Dropping off clothes your kids have grown out of to another mom. Asking, offering, and expecting favors. These are not trite ways of saying, just be kind. They are community mothering. They are stepping up and taking care of other mothers and families as mothers have always done when society won't. With all the ways we are set up to shrink inside, inside the buzzing task work of our mothering lives, mothers sometimes forget the great expanse of our capacity. This is when we call on our support network the mom friends who truly get it, the other mothers, the chosen family, the babas, the mapas, the aunties, even the special fathers, the people who will sweep in and care for our kids, the ones who also plead for our help, reminding us that we can take care of them right back. These are the ones who rescue us, who respond to our post-rage shame texts with the right words. You think that's bad? You should have been at my house tonight. Ew, sounds like he was being a jerk. I'm coming over with wine. You'll hug them in the morning and no one will even remember what you're saying sorry for. The kids will be fine. You are a good mom. Oh. Minna. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the group and see if anybody has anything to share, any comments, any questions. Let me go to my gallery view. Any thoughts? I see so many wonderful people here. Don't be shy. Too many thoughts and questions. <laughs> hey, Orianne. Yeah, you know, let me go back to my speaker. I have a question. Sarah, okay. I have like 42 questions. Hi, Minna, I love your reading. Yeah. I have your book. Your book just arrived. Some people know that I couldn't get the cardboard off, so I got to have a little tantrum. Um, I have a lot of questions. I think 
some of the biggest ones is about the sort of irony of also having to like parent and have time to write while writing this book on a pressure deadline about parenting and, you know, um, the sort of compounding factors. And um, I just saw the link that um, Chloe shared from Rom the Romper article of like, you'd think the sort of end point of this is like, I yell at my kids less or something, but of course not. That's not really the the point even, I don't think. Um, so I, I guess I just have questions about like that writing process for you. Um, I was joking that when you yell at your kids, it's research, right? But it's like, um, what did that feel like to be in that, in that mix at that moment with that subject? Um, so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. It's sort of an open-ended question. And then I have a a sort of comment question about metrescence as a as a term and a as a period in one's life or a repeated yeah. period. <clears throat> um, I think you're right. I think that that like my parenting and my writing, like I've called it before, is like it's a symbiotic feedback loop. Like I I parent and then I write about my parenting, which helps me to process my parenting, and then I think I parent better momentarily <laughs> right it's not progress isn't linear um so you know I do think that that was happening and as I was writing this book like it was it was a struggle to write it during the pandemic and I was having really big feelings when I was writing this book and um I think that it I was like learning as I was writing but I'm always learning like it's never gonna end I'm never gonna get to some like and scene like it's never gonna it's never gonna stop right like we're always learning we're always fit trying to figure out how to how to mother better and I'm always going to be learning how to um feel my big feelings and figure out how to express them in a way that is healthy and um you know potentially helpful <laughs> uh and definitely not harmful right like I'm I'm always on that process and um yeah, I think, you know, that that romper piece that came out today that says, you know, I I feel like as the person who wrote this book, I'm supposed to say I never yell at my kids anymore, but that's like totally unrealistic. Of course, I still like yell at my family. But I would say that like, that's not also not like the full story. Like, I think I'm much smarter about my rage and, and figuring out like when I'm, when I'm going to explode. And I did not, but I did not become like a perfect person from writing this book, which feels like an unreasonable expectation. Um, Amy has a question, a process question. How did you figure out how to balance the memoir sections and reported sections of the book as you wrote? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, it is a great question. I didn't, it, I, I am, I'm a very much not a planner as a writer. Like I do not map things out. I have no outline. <laughs> I mean, I like came up with general ideas and then I interviewed the moms and the themes that came out from the interviewing sort of helped me figure out like how to lay out the book. Um, but I definitely like, I was constantly figuring it out, basically. Like I would make lists of like, okay, I have this memoir section in chapter one. There's, you know, there's really no memoir in chapter eight, which is the policy chapter. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I also had to like, I had to figure out how to like, it, at first I wanted everything to be very uniform because I am like a very, like, I, I want things in life to be uniform. Like, and I'm very like, Virgo stereotypical in that way right so I wanted every chapter to be the same and at some point I realized that it was harming the book to try and do that and that certain chapters needed different things and I think my guess is that some readers will prefer certain parts of the book right certain parts that have more of my life story and certain parts that are more about the social overlay and the culture of motherhood than my story or more of the mom stories you know so um, the answer is, I don't know how I did that. It just sort of like, it just sort of melded. And I will say that my editors were super helpful. Like, um, they really had to, there was so much more research and so many more quotes from other people that they were like, your voice is the authority. You don't need to back up everything you say with quotes from experts, 
right? Because you are the expert on this subject in this book. And so it it was really helpful to have other mothers, right? Because basically everyone, I, almost everyone I worked with at Seal Press um, is a mother telling me that. Uh, so that was also part of the balance. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah, I didn't forget your question about matrescence. Do you want to ask that now? Um, sort of, I mean, I feel, I feel, um, that maybe reading the book, you know, will, will answer some of it for me. So I don't want to, um, speak to something that the book will speak to totally, but just in my line of work, one of the things I do is support, um, people who are giving birth and, um, matrescence as I know it from that, that, um, period in, of life, I knew as a, a term coined by a midwife or midwives who are describing the period between when your estimated due date is and when your baby comes for people for whom there's that sort of wilderness of like, when am I going to become a parent? Um, and acknowledging all the ambiguity of emotion that can arise in that time and the the kind of what is your identity? Like, are you parenting already? Are you not parenting? Are you, you know, are you a mother, depending how you identify? So I'm just curious kind of what your relationship with that term is and how what what it means to you in the in the book per se. Yeah, I so the person Dana Raphael is the the uh person in the 1970s who coined that term and who also coined the term doula. Uh but I'm using or orally Athens um definition of matrescence in this book. For those of you who don't know, she is a matrescence scholar and I think reproductive women reproductive something scholar she's amazing at a teacher's college at columbia and i'm talking to her we have an event actually on monday um at the library at columbia if anyone wants to come and it's going to be live streamed um but her definition is more that matrescence can actually start before the baby is born it can like that it's it's the life phase of becoming a mother right so it can start like when you're doing the adoption process or when you begin IVF, like that, like when you're becoming a mother, it can start then. And that it can restart with each child and, and theoretically it could last a lifetime. So I look at matrescence and I, I, I went down this rabbit hole of like obsession in the research of the, the book, comparing adolescence and matrescence as these two life phases and what happens to, they're both these like, tectonic shifts that you go to that have like physiological, neurological, social, cultural, psychological changes. And there's a lot of similar, uh, they've just discovered that the neurological changes in the brain are really similar in both phases. And I just like went down this hole anyway. Um, yeah, but I talk a lot about matrescence in the book and you should chapter that, that chapter that I read matrescence and the gaslighting of mothers. Um, so I won't go too much more into it. Does anyone else have a question? I think Nicole put a question in the chat. Hmm. Okay, yes, I see some questions here. I, I'll it's just read so it. exciting to see how much attention your book is getting, but you yourself are also getting so much attention and being asked to speak about the ideas in your book in interviews, radio, TV. How has it felt to go from writer putting ideas on the page to public speaker? You're so good at it. That's what I told you this morning. Um, it's it's really weird. <laughs> I feel like it's this thing that doesn't happen for fiction writers. And it's like, it's a very specific, like nonfiction writer thing that happens where when you're writing about like a cultural phenomenon or, or even not like, I did a panel about this actually at the last AWP, this writers conference about uh, non-memoirists be being turned into activists because of the topic mm -hmm. that you write about even if you didn't mean to become an activist like it, I think that writing is a form of activism and I think of this book as a form of activism but I never set out to like be a mom rage speaker or something um you know I mean originally my mom lists were about like all sorts of things about motherhood mm -hmm. like it, I, it, I don't know um it is interesting. It is both like terrifying because I get afraid to like speak in front of crowds and um, wildly exciting that like anyone cares what I have to say. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's both. It is, it is really scary. And I, and, you know, talking about mom rage is still, is still a taboo topic. Like I still get hate emails, you know what I mean? Like people are still very angry that this is being talked about this way. Um, and so it is like, it's a little scary. And like, I'm about, I'm really about to embark on my, my book tour. Like this is sort of the beginning and like, I'm a little afraid of what could happen at some of the events, but mostly I think that like, it's really going to be a room like this, which is like a room full of people who care. And (laughs) for the most part, I think people are, um, silently and loudly cheering and I don't know, that feels good. We have a lot more questions coming in. I often think about urban design or lack of suburban design and how we no longer live in communally. And I wonder if that's part of what leaves mothers unsupported and expected to make do on their own. Like part of the problem of loneliness of this country impacts mothers on another level. Mm, Yeah, like the suburban, like the the suburban design keeps Mm -hmm. Keeps us separated. I mean, I think there's some truth to that. I think it's, I think it's that. And I think that it's so much bigger than that. Like it's both, like there are all these ways that like the nuclear family is kept in its little box and maybe it has more lawn around it, or maybe it has like an apartment above. And I think that the more separation that we have, the stronger the loneliness is, but I think all the messaging from, you know, the PR team also tells us that like, we are not to talk about what's, what happens in the home, that the home is a private place. And if you talk about it, you're being disloyal. Um, mm. And so, you know, everyone is dealing with like, you know, I mean, if everyone's different and like our circumstances are different, but like I interviewed moms from all over the world, from all different backgrounds. And like the rage is remarkably the same. And so I just feel like moms in general are struggling all with the same things in their tiny little boxes and like isolation of motherhood, um, particularly in America, but like, especially anywhere that's like upholding the nuclear family um, is, is experiencing mom rage. So, yes. How did you find the, the moms to openly share their stories with you? And did you have to work with them to get them to open up? What was that like? Um, I found them mostly through social media. I just like put it on social that I was looking and like begged people to reshare it with their networks. I was just trying to get it to bubble out so that it wasn't all my network people. You know, I didn't want to interview people just that I knew, um, because that would skew, uh, who I got. So, you know, social media was a big help. And then sometimes I would, um, you know, I'd be looking for a particular person who fit a particular identity. Cause I was like, Oh, mm-hmm. I need this person. I need, I need someone who fills this bill who has mom rage. So I also was looking for particular people who didn't come to me automatically. Um, and then in terms of like how I got them to talk to me, I actually think that, I mean, two things. One, I think I have, I have a background in getting people to write and talk about hard things. I was a writing workshop facilitator for over a decade with pregnant te- and parenting teenagers. Um, and I've, oh. so I've been, I've been getting moms to write their stories for a very long time. Um, so I think a, that like I'm practiced at it and I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and, um, B, I think that actually moms really want to talk about this and mm-hmm. that it actually didn't take very much to, to get moms to talk about it. And for many of them, for the, it was the first time that they talked about, about mom rage, about, um, about birth trauma, about all sorts of things. And I think that most of them were grateful to have the space. Um, we have a comment here, a couple of comments. The nuclear family needs so much triage. And Hester says, we're also removed from family and our own mothers, grandmothers as we ensue. So we lose that wisdom. Um, I'm wondering like how you see this happening or working on an intergenerational level. Like, is there something different happening now? Um, is the rage worse now or just different? You know, did you talk to older women? Yeah. I mean, I talked to, I talked to some grandmothers who had mom rage Mm -hmm. um, and the main thing that I like gleaned from them is that 
They still hold the guilt. They still have one of them talked about having nightmares still. So the guilt like hasn't left from the mom rage that they had. Um, and I mean, to, re to respond to that, like I, I mostly, ta I mostly tackle the grandmother issue, um, in a, from a lens of you never get to rest mm -hmm. because like some huge percentage, I don't remember the exact number of mothers who, who have paid jobs or who work full-time paid jobs use childcare or get their mothers to do childcare. Mm -hmm. so it's like, because there is no care infrastructure in America, aside from this term that I coined money or mommy, right? So if you can't pay for it, it's on you, right? Um, and if you can't do it because you're full-time working, you go to your mother. Mm -hmm. or and so the, the, the care work expected of mothers does never ends. It continues into grandmotherhood. Um, so I looked at it that way, but I will say that there are other cultures even in America, right. Where like the grandmother is very involved, right. It's a, like, I have grandmothers who are, who are not as like, they don't want to take care of my children, like for m multiple days, I can't go away on like a trip or something with my husband. But I think that there's like, you know, multi-general, multi-generational housing in America has like quadrupled since 1970 or tripled. And part of it, I think is part of it is financial, but a lot of it is about, is about caregiving. And so I think there's something to, I think there's something valuable in that. I don't necessarily think that the people taking care of kids need to be the grandmother. I feel mm -hmm. like the idea of the children being all of ours is more where I'm pushing towards. Like my brother can take care of my kids and my friend can take care of my kids and my neighbor can take care of my kids. Like you don't actually have to be in the family to take care of children and to be a help to mothers. You also write about how sometimes having a grandparents help is actually more work on the parents because they need so many, they need to be cared for in the process of taking over to care for the kids. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I talked yeah. to some moms who talked about the grandparents, like having the grandparent help was sometimes more labor and less and like even less helpful than if they just hadn't come. And that's mm -hmm. not true for everyone, but right. you know, when you have someone who's not like more integrated into your life, just show up, you have to teach them. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's someone who's, who's older or who, or who's like, you know, it's been 40 years since they took care of children, it's a high learning curve. And they also need a lot of care themselves. Like, I think that the solution of relying on elders to take and by elders, I mean like the elderly to take care of children is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Minna, we have like four minutes left um, here as a group. Is there any, la are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with or are there any last questions? Um, I mean, I think that I, it's sort of a tricky thing with the subject, but I feel like I try very hard to like, to find hope that there is, that there is, is hope here that like, we're not just mm -hmm. like, even though the systems are against us, like that there's hope in community that like, it's actually possible, um, to find community and to find joy and to get support. Um, and that there are all sorts of ways to do it if we step outside of the confines of what is supposed to be a good mother or a good family. Right. Like not getting, like talking about the mom rage, letting it out into the light, but not getting stuck in it. Like it doesn't stop. The story doesn't end there and doesn't, doesn't stop with that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would just say, share, share the gospel. Yes. Tell, and tell, tell us, tell us about your event. I'm so excited to meet you and we've never met. Minna and I have never met, but I'm meeting her on Friday. Tell us about your events in New York City this week. Uh, on Thursday, I have an event. Thursday night, I have an event at the Marlene Myers and JCC on the Upper West Side with Ali Yarrow, who wrote Birth Control. Um, I think it's called Men's Power Over Motherhood. On Friday, I'm doing a Berk uh, 
Brooklyn Book Fest event. That's mm -hmm. a 10-year celebration of Mother Magazine with some other incredible readers, where also Stella will be. And then on Monday the 2nd, I think, um, I'm doing an event uh, at Teachers College at Columbia with Orly Athan, uh, which I'm really excited about. And that one will also be live streamed. That's yeah. great. So we can register and get the get the link? Yes. Okay. I think Chloe will share some links here. I, um, I put Minna's website into the chat. I want to thank you both so much. This was really interesting. I first met both Shasta and Stella at Sarah Lawrence at the MFA program. And I met Minna through the ARM program, which is the most wonderful community. You guys, I really appreciate you sharing so much about the book and really great questions. If we, I'm going to end the recording. Thank you. Did I? I did not.